welcome to The Book of Life, a show about Jewish books, music, film, and web. I'm Heidi Estrin. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida. Additional support comes from the Association of Jewish Libraries. Tova Mervis is well known as the author of The Ladies' Auxiliary and The Outside World. Her newest book is called Visible City. It's the story of New Yorkers seeing each other and being seen in all new ways. I had hoped to meet Tova in person at Book Expo 2014, but it didn't work out, so we recorded this interview by Skype from her home in Boston. So, Tova, tell us about your newest book, Visible City. I started writing Visible City soon after moving from New York City to Boston, and I moved from a very busy city to a suburbs, and I was really struck by the difference in how we see strangers and see people we know. One of the things I missed was that in the city, that you that feeling that people are all around you, that you walk down the street and see strangers and, and past friends all the time. Oh, you know, living in the city, I never felt the need to buy curtains because I felt like people can see me and I can see them, and it felt like that was just part of the anonymous intimacy of city life. And then in the suburbs, I really realized quickly how much I needed to buy curtains, how exposed <laughs> I felt, and standing in my own window in my own house. And it made me think about windows and watching people, and I think I took my homesickness for New York and use that to fuel this novel. It's a visible city. It's about a woman who watches her neighbors from her window in Manhattan and at first is content just to watch their lives and imagine what goes on for them. But eventually she becomes involved in different ways in their lives and their, the different um, struggles each of the characters have intersect with each other. It's an interesting answer that it was born of homesickness. Are you still homesick for New York? I'm much less so. I guess it's taken me about 10 years to come to terms with living in Boston. It's different. You know, I I love to go back to New York, but it doesn't have the same sense that it used to that now I'm home. And I think in many ways, homesickness is a great fuel for writing. We see places most clearly when we no longer live in them. And that longing for a place, I think, can be a really good way to capture a place in writing. Hmm. The characters in this book are incidentally Jewish, which is very different from your earlier books about Orthodox life. Why this change? When I first started it, sort of in my mind, the characters were Jewish, and I felt like the book was somehow going to become more explicitly Jewish as I wrote. It seemed clear to me that these characters were Jewish by birth. It did take me by surprise how it did not become one of the central themes of the book, the way, as you said, it was so much a part of my earlier novels. I never felt like I made a decision that this book was going to be different. It just felt like the issues of community and belief and belonging that are very important to me as a writer were not center stage here. But I do feel like the book is Jewish in that, you know, it's still the same, right? It's my same Jewish eyes that are so steep in the Jewish world, still looking out at a different context and a different palette and cast of characters. I feel like what follows me into this book from my earlier work is the sense of how we view ourselves versus how we're viewed by the people around us feels like important to me in all my work, and whether that be a neighborhood community or a religious community, but that feeling of being watched and that question of how we fit in. And I had a conversation with my editor at some point in writing the book about whether I should explicitly mention the fact that all the characters are Jewish. And she said to me, you have a therapist, an academic, and a lawyer on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Don't worry, we know they're Jewish. (laughs) I took her advice. That's good. I was going to ask you if you considered Visible City a Jewish book, but I guess you've kind of answered that already. I do. I mean, I guess in the way that I'm not sure, you know, I feel like, is the Ladies' Auxiliary a Jewish book? Well, yes, I guess it is, but it's also a Southern book, and I feel like any book can be classified lots of different ways, and so... I don't get too worried about what is a Jewish book or what's not a Jewish book. Of course, I'm a Jewish writer, but of course, I'm lots of kinds of writers. And so I feel like it's a Jewish book in whatever way that a book can belong to a certain religious order. 
Do you feel like there's any kind of progression from one book to another, from Ladies Auxiliary to The Outside World to Visible City? Whenever you write, as years pass, you learn things as a writer, and you learn both craft issues, but I think maybe what I've learned most in the 10 years that it took to write Visible City is I wanted to be able to delve deeper into characters and wanted to be able to render complex feelings and to have that sense that nothing is right or wrong or good and bad in these clear-cut ways, that life is impossibly complicated sometimes. I hope that that came across in my own life. I came to know that in lots of different ways and wanted that to come across on the page. But in some ways, I feel like Visible City is a counterpart to Ladies Auxiliary, maybe, where there's that same question of who's watching whom, how do we shape ourselves based on what we see in other people. And I think it's still playing out that question that interests me so much of where is the line between ourselves and other people and where are we independent and where are we affected so much by how others view us. Like in saying that, that could be describing both those novels. Mm Mm-hmm. This book is very much about seeing and being seen in superficial ways and in authentic ways. And I feel like this relates to social media, where we're all watching each other all the time. Did you feel a connection between those two things? I did, and I was very interested in how we present ourselves publicly. I'm really fascinated with the gap that exists between our public facades and our private inner lives. But novels are all about really that gap that exists between what we say and what we think. The novel has access to both. And so I feel like Facebook is this fascinating example of a way in which we can present our public sides even when we're home in private. And I'm interested in how we all put our game faces on all the time. We present our perfect happy lives, or at least most of my Facebook friends do. We post our best photos, our best moments. But it's rare to find times when people post the things that live privately inside of us that are hard and complicated and painful. And so I was very interested in that question in the book. And the book doesn't really explicitly mention social media, but I think the urge to see in someone else's windows is about the urge to see behind the facade, to see private moments where the real exists more fully when we're not posing and not aware that we're being watched. To sort of expand on that, on the Jewish Book Council's blog, The Pros and People, you said that you've always thought of a novelist as a kind of voyeur. So much of novel writing comes from this interplay of something you watch and then a story you create about it. I think voyeurs do the same thing. Voyeurs only see a piece of the story, right? We only see that little piece that happens in that window when we're watching. And I think one of the the thrills of voyeurism or any kind of people watching is that we create stories out of what we see about other people. A lot of it is based on our imaginations. We take one fact and we open it up and expand it. And we do it with people we pass on the street. We do it with friends of ours, with our family members, where we imagine or try to understand what's going on for other people. A lot of what we imagine about other people is not really about them. It's about us. The story I create about a person I see probably tells you as much about my own interests and my own worries than it does about this person I'm using in my story. And so I feel like that idea of seeing and then creating is central to what it means to be a novelist. Mm, Okay. When I finished Visible City, I was actually smiling. Um, I found this book really empowering. It seemed to be saying that anything's possible if you're bold enough to choose change. Now, how does this tie in with the themes of seeing that are so strong throughout the book? Thank you. That question of change was so important to me. And in an earlier draft of the book, everyone was unhappy, but no one acted on it. And I thought I was writing realistic fiction, so I thought, well, no one does anything about their lives. Everyone kind of just (laughs) ruminates and stews in it, but no one makes change. And then I learned people do take those moments when the world opens up and you make a change. And it's terrifying, and it's also exhilarating, and sometimes it's necessary. And so I wanted to write about that question of when do we grab our own lives and make change. And I didn't want to offer some whitewashed version of change is easy because change comes with enormous loss. But maybe with seeing, I don't think we can make change until we are willing to see what's around us. I know all too well how easy it is not to see things we don't want to know. I think it's amazing. You can live for a very long time in that state. And when we're willing to open our eyes and see other people, that's the beginning of change. 
So those are all the questions that I had. Is there a question that you wish I would ask you? I guess I always love talking about the stained glass in the window, Invisible City. Oh, yes, please. Sort of a late entry to the book, I got interested in stained glass, but you mentioned the book is about seeing and not seeing, and I was interested in the way that stained glass is a form of window which we don't get to see through. We're not supposed to see through it, and it made me think about that there are times when we see into people and when we can't. I like stained glass as a metaphor in the book. I felt like writing a novel was the way I imagined it must feel like to make a stained glass window. I spent a lot of time looking at these gorgeous stained glass windows in museums, and I just thought, God, how much time would it take to actually put in each little piece? Each little piece, just one little small spot of color, but then you step back and you see this whole... It was really inspiring to me in the 10 years that it took to write Visible City because it made me think of today I put in one small piece and eventually, hopefully, it will form this whole. Well, I felt like the stained glass really added another wonderful layer to the story. Thank you. Thank you so much. (laughs) What are you working on next? I am working on a memoir. I have trouble saying that word. I feel like I should say it a hundred times because I'm nervous about the idea that I'm writing a memoir, but, (laughs) but I am. I'm officially writing a memoir. And I'm writing about religion and a little bit about divorce, speaking of change. I wrote an essay that was in the New York Times in February about getting an Orthodox get, the Jewish divorce document, and how that ceremony really made me think about my own relationship to Orthodoxy and the community I've always been part of and realize that I was really changing or had changed. And this ceremony was really a leave-taking for me in a lot of ways. So I guess in many ways it's sort of picking up on the themes I've been talking about with Visible City how you make change. and In the memoir, I'm writing about how you make religious change and what happens when you decide that the community or the religious world you've spent your whole life in is not one you really believed in deeply enough and decide to do something different. And so I'm asking this question about how you make change and what are the losses, which are enormous, and what are the gains, which also are enormous, and how you can craft for yourself your own sense of belief, even when it comes at the expense of belonging sometimes. So that's kind of what I'm knee-deep in right now. Okay, well, I definitely look forward to reading that. Thank you. Tova Mervis, thanks so much for speaking with us. Thank you very much. There are so many ways to connect with the Book of Life. Fan us at facebook.com slash Podcast. Follow us at twitter.com slash bookoflifepod. Email us at bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 561-206-2473. You can also listen to the latest episode by phone at 916-313-3820. And, of course, find links to everything at bookoflifepodcast.com. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida at cbiboca.org and is supported in part by the Association of Jewish Libraries at jewishlibraries.org. Our background music is provided by the Freilach Makers Klezmer String Band at freilachmakers.com. Thanks for listening and happy reading. Thank you.